At Federal, we have products for every season and every pursuit. Our passionate and dedicated teams design, build, and deliver the world's best American-made ammunition, whether you're hunting, target shooting, or defending yourself and family. Our pride and hard work can be found in every box, ammo can, or bottle of ammunition. For us, it's always in season. It's federal season. Welcome to Federal Ammunition's podcast, It's Federal Season. I'm Jason Nash here with Brian Kelvington. And today we welcome Tom Dockin, a 40-plus year veteran of dog training and a great friend of Federal Ammunition. Tom, great to have you on the podcast and welcome. Well, thanks for having me. I, uh, I always enjoy our chats and uh, it's good to talk to Brian again as well. Yeah, we're going to get into to you and Brian and, and his dogs, I know. Um, but just a little background on, on you, and we know you've, you've written many books, you've hosted TV segments on national shows, trained countless dogs over your long career. What is it about the world of dog training, um, whether it's bird dogs or just companions, um, that, that really inspires you and has kept you at it for so long? Well, I, I think the, you know, the dog aspect of it, was uh, was something that really kind of it brings the whole thing together, you know. Especially when you're out there hunting, and I know people say to me, "says uh, you know, I'll go out and I'll pheasant hunt by myself." They say, "Okay, you go out and hunt alone." I go, "No, I got my dog with me." <laughs> so it's you know, it's it's one of those things that the dog brings out. I think the experience more than anything, whether you're waterfall hunting or or pheasant hunting or upland hunting. You know, even if you're out shed hunting for antlers uh, in the spring, it you always have a companion that wants to go out and, and do something with you. So, and I think that that bond, you know, not only are these dogs hunting dogs, but but they're family dogs. And I know my dogs are are that. Uh, you know, so you spend basically 365 days a year with them, and and uh, they become family. So I, I think it just ties everything together, and the companionship is a big part of it. That's great. Well, I think. Any of us who'd, who've owned a dog, especially a bird dog, uh, definitely understand that. So, you know, starting with the basics um, and choosing a dog, um, I mean, if I was looking for a hunting companion and, and the one I had, uh, don't have any more, was a Ryman-type uh, English setter. But mm-hmm. uh, w- what should I, what would someone look for? Uh, what factors should they consider when they're, they're evaluating which type of dog to get for themselves? Well, I think you first need to figure out what, you know, what are your hunting interests? You know, so if you say, well, you know, I'm going to go hunt sea ducks, you know, you go like, well, what kind of dog would you need to do that in those brutal conditions and something that they would excel at? Well, it probably wouldn't be, you know, like a Brittany or a pointing breed. Obviously, it would have to be a retrieving breed. On the same hand, if you say like, I'm a diehard grouse hunter, that's, that's what I love to do, or a diehard quail hunter. Well, then you're going to be probably shifting more to the pointing breeds, even, even in the pheasant, you know, area as well, even though you can hunt pheasants with uh, retrievers and spaniels, you just got to figure out first, what are you going to be hunting? And then what dog would match your environment as well? And even within the pointing dog breeds, you know, some of the pointing dog breeds need a lot more space on a daily basis to just get enough exercise, maybe than others. So those are the factors. Figure out what you're going to hunt first, and then then start selecting the breed within whether it's a retriever, flusher, or a pointing breed. Hey Tom, full disclosure, you know your uh, your team and you yourself, you worked on both of my Springers, Cusco and Mocha, and mm-hmm. they've become great skilled hunters and better. They're great family members. So not to be Captain Obvious, but a trained dog, I'm assuming, uh, improves the relationship and reduces stress and chaos. Correct. Well, it does because, you know, think about if you're, if you're living with them, you know, just the basic obedience alone, you know, even if we just pull the hunting part of, you know, out of it, you know, if you have a well-behaved family pet, you're going to do a lot more with them, you know? So if, if you have a dog that listens well, pays attention, not only to, you know, you as the owner, but, but maybe a significant other or kids, you're going to find reasons to take that dog with you no matter where you go. If you have one that does not behave, all of a sudden that dog becomes more isolated 
And, you, you know, it becomes more of a burden situation than, um, hey, we're going to the store, we're going to, you know, we're going to do this. Uh, you know, the dog would be a natural, hey, let's let's go. And our dogs do that. They pretty much go everywhere with us. But, you know, without some control, you know, and, and having a dog that behaves, yes, then then it becomes a different situation. So give us some general recommendations on when to start your puppy in the training cycle. Well, nowadays it's it starts off, and I always tell people it starts probably the minute that you pick that puppy up from the breeder. And an explanation for that would be uh, when I would pick a puppy up, you know, and I mean physically pick a puppy up at you know from a breeder or or a puppy that I'm going to select. Uh, when I pick it up and hold it in my arms for the first time, um, I'm actually going to start the training process then. And and what normally happens is you're picking that puppy up and you're taking it away from its litter mates. So you've picked it up, you have it in your arms, and that puppy is going to want to communicate and say, well, I want to get back down with my, you know, with my litter mates. So what they'll do is they'll start to struggle in your arms. And what I'll do, the first little lesson that I'll do is when they start to struggle, and, and they're all a little bit different, but if they start to struggle, I'll just put a little pressure against them while I'm holding on to them. And you're going to find out a little bit about your puppy's personality by how much they struggle. And as they struggle, I'll just increase the pressure. As soon as they relax in my arms, I'll let the pressure off. So what they're learning is, is, is if, I, if I'm going to fight to try to get away from being held or controlled, um, it doesn't work. As soon as I relax and comply, um, you know, I'm going to be put back on the ground. So it actually really starts the first time you pick that puppy up, because when you think about it, if they learn to give into a little bit of pressure, if you have them on a leash, don't they, you know, really need to learn how to give into some pressure on a leash and then treat training starts, you know, day one, as soon as your puppy will take a little kibble out of your hand, you know, start using it, start using it for the come command. Uh, and, and the nice part about doing that, starting it so quick is you're not forcing your puppy to do anything. Uh, they're actually working for that that treat. So they'll always work better early on when they're babies if they're working for themselves. They're not really working for you. They're working to get that reward. Later on in training, that's going to be go to a praise reward. Um, but early on, treat training will start. So I tell people by the time they're 12 weeks old, they should know to come, sit, lay down, kennel, um, all your basic commands because um, it can be food-based. And then gradually by the time they're around four to five months old, it really starts going all to leash and then starts going more to praise. But literally day one, that's when it should start. Uh, that's good advice. And, you know, there's obviously trainers like yourself, Doc, Doc and Oak Ridge Kennels, but there's also do-it-yourself. Uh, there's a crowd that does it yourself. Are there any guidelines that um, may, maybe help you determine which one – you should do whether it's do your DIY or select a trainer. I think you have to first say, do I have the time? You know, do I have the time to do it? Um, because it is a commitment of time. So uh, if you had that, you know, 20 minutes a day, you know, especially when they hit a certain age, you know, by the time that they hit, you know, a hunting dog, I'm saying by the time they hit five, six months old, do you have that 20 minutes a day or a half hour that you'd have to commit to your puppy? To actually get it done and there's windows uh, opportunity so if you say well i didn't get to it but now he's a year old well but you probably have a lot of habits now that you have to try to break and the problem with breaking habits is the longer that habit's been in existence it's like cutting off weeds you can cut them off at the surface but but they're always going to be trying to pop up so do you have the time to do it and then also resources you know, a lot about training a dog is kind of like building a house. You know, you have to put the foundation down first, then you can put up the walls, then you can put up the rafters. Uh, and, and so everything has a step process. Nowadays, there's so much good information out there, books, DVDs, you go online. You know, it, it, the information is, you know, just almost overwhelming. But the thing is, just go do something. You know, a lot of people go, well, I, I didn't want to do anything because I didn't want to screw them up before you get them in for training. Well, no, that, that'd be like sending a child to school. He's going to kindergarten and you hand him off to the teacher and say, well, I think he knows his name. You know, so you, you really have to kind of go get, get started, 
get involved with it, get the information you need. But then a professional trainer, you know, that's that's what we do for a living. We we that our job is to take the time every day to train your dog. But then even if you have a professional trainer, you have to learn from the professional trainer what you need to do at home to maintain the training once the dog leaves. Perfect. Tom, one of the things, you know, I, I did, I mentioned I had a, a setter and pointing dog and, and I did mm-hmm. train him myself because I had lots of time back then and sure. uh, I made plenty of mistakes, but I noticed that it took my dog a long time to really become a good hunter. And some of that could have been just the, the amateur training, but do you see a difference in breeds? What do you typically consider your timeline for, for dogs to really grow into a, a great hunting dog? I think even within breeds, um, it does make a difference. And then not only, and then also male versus female, you know, your females tend to mature a little quicker, no different than when we were in junior high, you know, the girls were always, you know, way ahead of the guys. Um, so your males will mature a little bit, you know, a little bit slower and then individual breeds. Now you had a setter and, and your setters, um, would be maybe different than an English pointer mm-hmm. or maybe different than a German short hair. Um, so, uh, certain breeds may be mature just a little bit slower, but then you've got to say from a hunting standpoint, if you're, you're saying, well, my dog took longer to kind of get it from a hunting standpoint, they say, well, how much, how much bird contact did I have that first season? I mean, did I have a tremendous amount of bird contact? Was I out? Let's say I was out like 90 days out of the season or was I out 20? And then the 20 days I went out, did we actually get birds every time we went out? Mm -hmm. So experience has a tremendous amount, you know, to do with that. And I would suggest to people, especially like if you're going to have an upland dog, you know, it's hard to predict, you know, especially with a young dog, you know, what what are you going to see when you go out hunting? And if the bird numbers are down, and you have a young dog on top of it, it's going to make it twice as hard. So I always tell people, take advantage, go to a game farm, take that young dog someplace where you know, every time that you go, you're going to produce some birds and he's going to get some experience. You know, they don't know that they're at a game farm and you say, well, that that's not the kind of hunt I want, but you got to figure that first year is all about the dog and it's your job to make sure that they're successful. Obviously, you know my story because I brought my two springers to mm-hmm. you guys because I didn't like Jason. Unlike Jason, I didn't have the time with three kids in high school. And sure. so, you know, I, I selected your the option of using a trainer. But mm-hmm. when do you, um, for bird dog owners, when do you start bringing that firearm into the um, training regimen? Well, our program is set up so at five months of age, uh, that's when we would do a bird and gun introduction program with a customer's dog. It's a, it's a two week course. And the, the whole emphasis is on introducing them properly to birds, getting them. And we say, introducing to birds, get them to the point where we call it, we get them birdie, get them excited about birds, get them fired up that, that this is my mission in life is to want these birds. And then the gun introduction is, is an extremely important part of that program too. It, it's one area of training that if you screw up, the gun, you may not be able to come back and get your dog out of gun shyness if you do it wrong. And so here you have this great puppy, maybe had great bloodlines, great breeding, had a really good start, had one bad gun experience because it wasn't done properly, and their career might be over before it ever started. So that's why we started that bird and gun introduction program with these young pups you know, when they uh, were five months old, probably about 35 years ago, because we'd see these dogs come in at a year, year and a half old, or maybe somebody had already shot around the dog. And your chances of having, you know, success get less and less as the dog gets older, or especially if they've already had a bad experience. It doesn't necessarily have to be a gun either. It can be loud noise. It can be a nail gun. It could be anything that spooks a young puppy. So we always tell people, if you're going to come in for that course, we just as soon have you not do any shooting before we get into that course, because let us do it. Cause we've done thousands of these bird and gun introductions. So um, you need to do it right. I tell people you can do a bad job with sit and still have a hunting dog. You can't do a bad job with the gun and still have a hunting dog. A great point. It is. 
What do you, um, when's the first time, when's the right time to take your hunting dog to the field for the first time? Only after they've been introduced to birds and gun, really, because if you're going to take them into the field and your purpose is to actually be able to shoot something for them, they have to be, they have to be gun broke properly. Um, and here's what, here's what can happen. So let's say you take a dog out that has not been shot around. Let's, let's say he's five, six months old. He's all of a sudden he's running around. Maybe he didn't see a bird get up and he hears this huge boom. All right. So it could be a, it could be a problem just with that noise. He goes like, Oop, I'm done. He comes running back to you for security and you can't, you just can't go like, Oh, that's okay. Go out and let's do this again. Or think about this. He stumbles on a bird and I say stumbles on a bird because a lot of times they don't know what they're doing to start with. The bird flushes and this huge boom goes off immediately after the bird flushes. Now you risk the factor that he says that bird made that loud noise that I'm afraid of. So now he does not even want to, if he smells a bird, no way is he going to go near it to flush it because he knows it causes that big boom. So we tell people once we get through a bird and gun introduction program and we're actually able to shoot birds over your puppy by the time he's five months old, we say, you have a hunting dog now. I mean, you do have a hunting dog. Do you have a trained dog? No, but you do have a hunting dog. And by trained dog, meaning is all of the control, all the obedience, you know, those are courses that we would do a little later on, get all of the control and all of the, you know, all of the more advanced work on them. But if you can shoot over your puppy and they love birds, then you can take them hunting. But I would not roll the dice and risk it and try to introduce your, your young dog to hunting if he hasn't been introduced to gun and try to do it in the field. We've seen too many bad cases and it's sad because... Uh, a gun shy dog is man made. It's not hereditary. And you know, this is for the folks out there. They'll say, well, the mother of this puppy, she was gun shy. And I'll be darned if this puppy wasn't gun shy too. And you go, well, maybe you want to look in the mirror because the same person who introduced the mother to the, to the gun introduced <laughs> the puppy. Right. So, so I'm telling everybody now, it's not genetic. It, it's something that happened. It's a man-made problem that happened. Tom, have you been able to reverse that? If you, have you had some gun shy dogs that have come in and you've been able to get them excited enough about the hunt to, to kind of break them of that? Yeah, there, it's all different degrees and it depends on how severe it is to be honest with you. What we would not do would be to go, well, let's just sit him down here and just keep banging the gun. <laughs> you're just you're just hammering the problem worse. So what we're going to try to do with, with a, a dog like that, we're going to try to get them, and we do this in our bird and gun introduction anyways, the first thing we do is get them as crazy about birds as we can. You know, going in and picking up a pigeon, then then chasing a, a, a clip wing pigeon on the ground and, and bringing out that as strong a pet predator drive as we can get. And then our, our, our gun introduction, once we have a, a dog introduced to birds that way, would it, no matter how it is, we always assume that that we're not going to try to correct a problem, even for a dog that has never had a bad introduction to the gun. That gun introduction starts with a blank gun and a bird being thrown out in front, you know, 40 yards away. And a little pop with that little 22 blank gun sounds like a hand clap. Okay. And then we're watching that dog or that puppy and, you know, each retrieve with the person out in front is throwing and somebody else is letting the, holding the puppy and letting it go retrieve. They're going to work that in a little closer each day. Always with that throw of that bird, something they like. And I always tell somebody, if first, if, if I started you wanting to like the gun, I'd hand you a $100 bill. And then I'd clap my hand and I'd hand you, hand you a $100 bill. And then I'd do it again. Pretty soon, you want to hear me clap my hands because you're going to get that $100 bill. Then I'd get out in front a little ways and I'd do the blank gun and I'd hand you, you know, and you'd come out and I'd give you 100 So So that, that same concept. Mm -hmm. So then each day we'd work in a little closer, a little closer, but we're always watching that dog's reaction. 
if they're just fired up and go, I got to get out there. I got to get out to where that guy is that, that has that bird. We'll move in a little closer each day, but you have to be, you know, really paying attention to what the dog is telling you or the puppy. And some like getting back to your question, some dogs you can, you know, you can rehab. It depends on how bad a situation they had. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's just not worth the gamble though, because the highest percentages of them are, are, are probably aren't reversible. Yeah. I've seen guys with puppies at the gun range and it doesn't seem to bother them. You know, I guess it all depends on how they've been introduced and Yep. I was always yep. surprised. <laughs> well, there's two ways of introduction. That would be, we call that a tolerance introduction. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? You're going like, okay, we're going to the gun range. And then we hope, key word is hope. <laughs> we hope the puppy or the dog tolerates the noise. Yep. Right? I mean, so with a positive reinforcement gun introduction, we've introduced something that they really love. And we've tied that to the gun. So there, there's two different ways to do it. Tolerance introduction or positive reinforcement. I'll take the hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and, and it, it, like I say, we've done thousands and thousands of them. And, and our job is to, is to move these puppies forward versus cause a problem and try to rehab. I mean, so it's always harder to rehab something than it is to move them forward. So, and and that was really a program that we initially started because when I first started training dogs, you know, most of the time we'd see a year old, year and a half old dog come in and we go, it just really doesn't have to be this way. And a five month old puppy is like a child. If you put a bunch of five year olds in a room together that they don't know each other in 10 minutes, they're playing. If you put, you know, uh, some teenagers in a room, 10 or 15 of them, it's not going to happen that quick. So those young puppies are ready to jump in and try anything, and that's why we target that age. Plus, at five months, they have their permanent canine teeth in, and uh, their mouth isn't going to be sore, you know, during retrieving. So we want to make sure that everything's positive. So if I'm a DIY guy, um, what mm-hmm. system do you, would you re- recommend that reward treat system or a little bit of the compulsive training, which may have some physical aspect of correction or is it a combination yeah. or is it a combination, Tom? Oh, it's, it's going to be a combination. And, and the reason we do that treat training early on, I mean, you got a little seven week old puppy, you know, to start with. So by the, you know, by the time, let's say they're 12 to 14 weeks, you know, they're pretty vulnerable at that age. So it's all, it's all positive, you know, motivation with the, with the food based reward. And then we start working the leash in there. So, uh, so we're going to use the leash. So we're saying right now he knows all the commands. He knows to come and sit and lay down and do all of these things. So he already knows it. So all we're going to do is just add a little pressure on the leash with the command and then still give him the reward. Okay. And then gradually, we're just going to wean away from the reward, uh, the food reward, and add a praise base. And then some discipline has to be necessary. Um, And and you will see this. Let's say, um, okay, your dog, you're living in suburbia. uh, Your dog is in the front yard with you, and it sees the neighbor dog across the street, and you see a car coming, and your dog is going to go running for it. And you give the come command and he goes, I'm not hungry right now. See what I mean? Yeah. So he, and just like us, you know, I grew up in a different area, you know, era, I should say, where, you know, you got decisions to make, um, you know, and making bad decisions, you know, would cost you something. So you want to have uh, the ability for these dogs to know that I'll always give you the chance to do the command properly. And then consequences are going to be based on, you know, the dog's personality. But, you know, uh, check cord or leash, remote training collars have, have changed dog training immensely within probably the last 20 years, even though they've been around for over 50, because the technology changed. So now, let's say if I gave a little tug on a leash and said, come, I can make the remote training collar about the same tug on the leash because I can set it at whatever level I need it for the dog's personality. 
So the collar actually will modify to the dog's personality so you never use any more corrections. So it's like you have a, a mile long leash on your dog. Mm -hmm. So now you can go out and you can have a dog performing everything off leash, basic obedience commands and in the field and act like you have a leash. So, um, but the food base for, for us, for what we want, because we need off leash. We need off leash with distractions. You know, a deer gets up, a rabbit gets up. Uh, the dog is going to go chase a car. Some of those things we, we need off leash. And I've never had a customer, even if it was an obedience customer, just straight obedience that goes, if I said, would you like your dog to come without the use of a leash? I've never had anybody say no. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. We always want that. We want to have it. And nowadays having the equipment that that's available to us, it's easier than ever to just reinforce the command. And you know what, what is nice about it is your dog, your dog wants to have some structure. They're a pack animal. They, they want structure. They, they actually need some structure and they're happier when they have, have some structure. I know Cusco and Mocha, they both like to have some structure, especially at 6.30 when it's time for breakfast. But <laughs> anyways, hey, Tom, if you don't mind sticking around, we're going to take, oh, yeah. take a little short break. Then we come back, we'll talk about some specific breeds and some hunting talk um, when we come back after the short break. Meet the industry's widest variety of game-changing ammunition. However you shoot and whatever you hunt, fortune favors the prepared and nothing prepares you better than federal premium it's a gold standard advantage delivered directly from the experts in premium ammunition find your federal premium advantage today welcome back to it's federal season and our technology segment tech talk Welcome back. We're joined by Tom Dockin of Dockin's Oak Ridge Kennels. He's a career dog trainer, author, and avid hunter. So, Tom, before we get into specific breeds, and I know we all want to talk about our favorite breeds, um, Tom, what are some tips you've got for late season uh, when dealing with the snow and cold conditions for a bird dog? Well, we're right now, actually, we're kind of dealing with it a little bit in South Dakota here right now. We got to uh, we got some snow and, and we got ice on, on a lot of the ponds and big, just a couple of things. Number one would be your techniques are going to change as far as finding birds, but, but keeping your dog, uh, you know, safe and healthy is a big thing. Uh, so, so some things right now is crusted snow is going to be really tough on your dog's feet. And if your dog is busting through a lot of snow, you got to be looking at them. You got to look at their chest for any abrasions cuts you got to be looking at their pads to make sure that they, they haven't ripped up their pads look at their nails to make sure that they haven't uh, on this ice haven't uh, started to get some uh, some cuts and sores right where the nail meets the toe um, that that's extremely important and also we never think about this that much during the you know the harder part of the season where it's cold we got extreme temperatures but these dogs get dehydrated really fast and they get dehydrated a little faster, even in, in these cold temperatures where you think, well, that doesn't make sense. It's not hot out, but they are going to get dehydrated. So you have your water bottles with you when you're out in the field, because this time of year, you're not going to run into any open water or a cattle dugout to let them, you know, jump in and, and get that. So bring your water bottles. I'm going to give you a tip on getting your dog to drink out of a water bottle. You can do this first if you just want um, just take like a, a normal water bottle that you might get and take and just smear some peanut butter on the end of the bottle and get your dog. So he recognized that bottle. He should go up and lick the end of it. And then just get yourself one of those bottles that has a little spout on it. And then you can start it there, but you want the dog to start targeting that bottle. And then I like using, there's a little additive, uh, digestive enzymes called Fortiflora. It's a Purina product. It's a granule that yeah, if your dog isn't good about drinking, especially when they're out hunting, a lot of them is like, I don't want to drink. I just want to go. Uh, put some of that Florida Flora because it tastes really good. Put it in their water bottle. They're going to they're gonna drink more. And then even uh, during, uh, you know, feeding time at night, go ahead 
And uh, if you want to put some of that on the food too, it's just going to give them better. So I had a dog that I'd take him on a hunting trip and, and you'd have to do just about anything to get him to eat because he was so fired up to eat. And, and you, know, you can't go two, three days without your dog eating when you're on a hunting trip. So you, you got to really look at them. Uh, end of the day, and I like doing this during the day too, uh, get your dog so he can roll over. You can just check him out really good. Eyes, ears, um, all different things. Weed seeds in their eyes. It's another big thing. Uh, don't go digging in there with your finger. My dogs are used to me like I'll, I'll kind of open the eyelids up a little bit and I'll blow in there to blow any weed seeds out. You know, it's just, it's little things, but it's, it's our job to make sure that they're safe. That's our job. Yeah. I just, you know, their job is to hunt. It's our job to make sure we take care of them. Yeah. Just experiencing that myself. We came back from South Dakota a week and a half ago and a lot of Milo fields and, and little Mocha got, um, she had a cut on her cornea. So a little scratch mm -hmm. on her cornea. So it yep. was just a matter of, of noticing it that first night and then taking her out of the field. So she didn't, um, hunt any further, do any more damage and then get her back to the vet. So it really is on the owner to make sure your dogs are ready to go. Can you, is there, should we be looking for like frostbite? Can dogs get frostbite, Tom? Well, I, I think you can put them in, depending on the breed too, I think you can put them in situations where, uh, I don't know if it's, it would be considered total frostbite, but you know, you could see, this would be more like if you had an outside dog that was maybe out all the time, you know, maybe in a back in a back kennel that you didn't have a good dog house or something. You'll see, you know, even wild animals that their ears will get froze. You know what I mean? So it, it, once again, it's how it's what environment you put them in. If they're moving, you know, I had an English pointer one time that, you know, you're hunting late season. I'm talking cold now below zero temps. And as long as you're moving, they're fine. You'd stop for 20, 30 minutes. You know, you'd be maybe by the vehicle. You go like, okay, we got to get going. I mean, they don't, they have a coat on them more for a purpose for hunting in, in warm climates and warm temperatures. Okay. So you have to be aware of that. And what your dog's coat is like German short hairs are going to have a tight coat. Any of your tight coated dogs, you know, I mean, as long as they're moving fine, and then if you're going to be transporting your dog not in the vehicle with you or maybe in the back of the vehicle, let's just say you have a topper, get an insulated cover to put over it. And then another thing that you want to do is, is maybe take and get a, a piece of styrofoam and put underneath the crate because that crate's going to probably be on that, on that metal bed. And so your dog is actually going to be cold, you know, doing that. And, and so, you know, protect them. You know, get them to the get them to where you know they're going to be protected. Uh, you know, in that situation. And then one other thing that I think is important, I try to tell this at the end of my seminars when I'm doing them, is two things. The last thing that you take out of the vehicle when you get to your hunting spot is the dog. The first thing you put away when you get back to the vehicle is the dog. And I'll tell you why. Let's say you let the dog out. You've just pulled off the gravel road. You let the dog out. Now you're looking for your shells and you're grabbing your gun and doing this. Well, your dog's probably not going to stand right there. All of a sudden, they're in the ditch on the other side. A vehicle comes by. I don't need to tell you what can happen. And I've been around this so long that you hear these stories. So if it's the last thing you take out of the vehicle, your eyes are on the dog and you're taking them. And if it's the first thing you put away, the dog's not running around the vehicle, getting in the ditch, getting on the road and having an accident. I mean, so, I mean, it's just another one of those things that we have to be thinking ahead and be responsible. Yeah. You, you talk about dog kennels and I, there are a lot of people who like to let their dogs ride loose in the car. And you know, when you can't fit a kennel, I, I get it, but I, I got in a pretty bad rollover accident at 70 mm -hmm. miles an hour and I had a, a pickup truck with a topper and my dog was in the kennel. And even though the wheels came off the truck and uh, the, the back tailgate fell off and the topper got crushed, that kennel saved my dog's life. And uh, he, he was fine. He had a little scratch on his, on his eye, and that was about it. So um, it's, it's right. important to protect him, like you said. It is. And, you know, you get, you know, you get to where you, you know, if you've hunted – for many, many years and you've, you're out in rural, 
rural America and you see these hunting dogs in the back of the pickup truck running loose, you go, geez, it just takes just takes one little thing and that dog's out of the pickup and and uh yeah and you know and, and the biggest thing is well that never happened before well if you'd never let it get to that point it's not ever going to happen yeah well let's talk about hunting tom and i know that you, yeah. and, you and your wife tina good mm-hmm. friends of mine and uh, i know your uh, loyalty to federal so you're out in South Dakota right now, pheasant hunting, most likely. Uh, I don't know, maybe still doing some dog, some duck hunting. What loads are you putting into your uh, into your bags, Tom? You know, everybody's different on this, but I'm a I'm a prairie storm guy, and I'm a number sixes guy. I mean, I I I love the prairie storm. I, I love the copper plating. Um, that that's that's what I'm going to shoot. Tina and I both. That's that's what we're going to shoot. Um, and, and depending on, on what gauge you're going to be shooting, you know, like uh, we shoot 20 gauges a lot. Um, and nowadays, I mean, when you can shoot three inch, you know, three inch sixes out of a 20 gauge, you know, I I just, I love sixes. It gives you a nice dense pattern. Some people maybe will go with fives or fours, but, but that's just kind of my go-to on pheasants. And, you know, we love, especially late season, you know, those birds are a little smarter, um, you know, you gotta be quiet, you gotta be sneaky and, and, uh, you know, we, we've just had great performance. So I'm not saying that cause it's federal. I, I, Prairie Storm, I'm a Prairie Storm guy. We appreciate it. Yeah. And ducks, you're shooting actually, you like the bismuth loads. Love it. Love it. And we shoot, you know, I grew up and we shot lead. That's just the way it was. I mean, you shot lead. So I, I like to, uh, I, I like that heavier shot that that you've got there, and then plus we you know we're going to be hunting canvasbacks, bluebills, redheads, and a lot of times you knock a down a bird down over the water. I mean, not everyone is dead, and so having that that pattern density and having that little smaller shot size for shooting cripples on the water, you're just not going to lose the number of birds. So um, when that product came out. I kind of went, thank you, thank you, thank you, because um, losing cripples is just something that just, just just kills you. And so if you can eliminate that by having the right shot size and then having a little heavier shot, you know what I mean, added because of the material, it, it just makes a, you know, just a better load. And people will say, well, you know, this is an argument like for, for duck hunters. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a more expensive than, uh, you know, you know, this, this other kind of material, I go, think of all the money you spend every year getting ready for hunting, all the different gadgets and decoys and boats and all of that. And a couple extra dollars on shotgun shells. So it's it, the argument's not there for not shooting, you know, shooting that kind of stuff. All right. Now into the topic that will, uh, we, that Jason and I have been anticipating and like wanted to talk about is breeds. Mm-hmm. All right, you know me, and you know my mm-hmm. you know my dogs, you and Mike, yep. you know my dogs, the flushers, they're the spaniels, golden retrievers, and labs. So what are the best uses for these dogs and and what what do they bring to the table? Well, you, you we're, let's go, let's go flushing breeds. And, and that'll I'll just include the retrievers because it basically they're, you know, I mean unless you okay, I'm going to get a pointing lab or try to train, you know, my lab to point. But let's just say flushing breeds which will include the retrievers. We'll start with them. Um, here's what here's what we know. So let's say we talk about Springers and English Cockers, right? So so those would be like straight, more figured for flushing. If I took a little Springer Spaniel puppy at seven weeks, put him on the ground, and I put a Labrador Retriever puppy on the ground in front of me, that little Springer puppy doesn't know why he's doing it, but off he goes. Okay, he's going I'm. I, I'm looking, I'm searching, I'm doing that little Labrador puppy. I'm tripping over. <laughs> okay. So what, what were they bred specifically for? And so you take like the little English cockers. Now I'm talking about, and the, uh, and the Springer Spaniels, they were bred to go out and search. That's what they were bred to do. So you're going to see that instinctively in them. And I said, I'm, I'm tripping over that lab puppy or the golden puppy or the Chesapeake. They've been bred you know, initially to sit next to a waterfall hunter, wait and go retrieve. Now, can they be taught to go out and hunt? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not, it's not real difficult, but you have to kind of 
nurture them in that direction. And then once they go, oh, there's something out here for me to go find, they'll do it. And that would be, that'd be the same way now with the pointing breeds. If I put a pointing dog puppy on the ground, they're instinctively going to go and search because their job has been to leave the hunter and go out, search and find. So uh, it's going to be based more on anything else is that what were they bred to do? you know, more than anything else. And what breeds were, let's say in the pointing dog breeds, were bred to maybe hunt a little closer than the big ranging dogs. So, I mean, those those are the things more than anything else. What was the dog bred for? Now, can you teach a dog different things? Sure you can. Uh, but instinctively, what were they bred for? Yeah, and I've, I've always been a fan of pointing dogs just because that was my first introduction to a hunting breed. Mm-hmm. And, and I like to grouse hunt. But one thing I noticed on on pheasants is sometimes you get a you want to honor a point, you get a dog that's really staunch and locks up on a hen. Meanwhile, the roosters are running to the end of the row. <laughs> you know, do you have any uh, thoughts on that or tips about w- what to do when you you know those the ones you can actually shoot are already at the end of the the row. <laughs> Well, this is the age old (laughs) question with (laughs) roosters and pointing dogs is that, yeah, you know, the dumb ones sat tight and got shot. Right. You know, so, you know, survival says run and people go, well, you know, my dog, my dog will only point roosters. I don't know about that one. (laughs) And I'll, you know, that's, and and what happens is that, you know, how many, how many hens did that dog go past? you know, before it, it got to that rooster. So, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, getting back to the, getting back to the question is it, birds that do run are, are tough on pointing dogs because we're telling the pointing dog, do not, as soon as you smell it, point. And you don't want a pointing dog that as soon as they smell it, well, get a little closer to it, go a little closer. I want you to get a little closer to it because what's going to happen as they get closer. Mm-hmm. It's going to flush, right? So now you that pointing dog's out there 75, 80 yards. He's on point. And we don't want him inching his way in there closer because it's going to flush before you get there. Um, and you're going to get, in a lot of cases, we call it false points, where the dog, oh, strong scent, comes on point. Now that bird moves out and runs about 30 yards or so. You come up there and go, that bird's got to be here. He's got to be right in front. He's pointing. And then all of a sudden the dog kind of goes, it's not as strong as it was. And now, okay, well, let's let him go. Let's let him move a little further. So you might have 10 or 15 false points as you work your way down this field. you know, always anticipating, oh, it's got to be here. It's got to be here. It's got to be here. Um, you know, whereas, you know, uh, we started hunting some Merns quail in Arizona, probably one of the best holding upland birds that i've ever seen i mean you could have a dog on point go eat lunch and then come back (laughs) and flush them i mean and that that would be the perfect bird you know for any pointing dog guy because they don't really on a on a normal basis run a lot they'll they'll just hold where they are so you have to be able to adapt and adjust and know that you're going to get some false points and the problem is for a lot of these pointing dogs they're going to start they're going to start doing more trailing because that bird is moving. And the more they trail, the more they're going to be pushing. So you you got to appreciate the times when you get those roosters to hold, but then the kind of cover that you go in might make a difference too. Another problem is late season. Now we're hunting cattail sloughs, you know, so not being able to see your pointer that they're on point. Well, then, Let's get some technology in there because now you can have a tracking collar on your dog and go, well, uh, I don't see him, but he's 50 yards away from me. And yeah, he's still moving or, oh, nope, he's on point. And you know the direction to go get him. I'll use a beeper collar late season if we're hunting a lot of big cattail sloughs, even on a flushing breed. And I don't want it. It's not going to continually beep. But if I go, well, I I can't, where is he? He might be 25 yards from me in perfect range. I'll just hit, and I set mine for hawk scream. I'll hit it, the the button, and it'll just give a hawk scream. 
so I know where he's at. But then my dogs have also been taught when they hear hawk scream, I want you to check back in with me. Oh, so I use it just like a whistle. So, you know, technologies there, you know, you know, especially for the pointing breeds now where, um, you know, you can give them a little bit more leeway and, and know that, okay, he's just over the hill, but he's, you know, he's 75 yards. Uh, as long as you know, your dog's going to point, obviously. Yeah. I, I used to use the old fashioned bell, but you know, on a windy yeah. day and especially as you get older, your ears, <laughs> your hearing goes worse. It's hard to hear, but, uh, yeah, there's some great technology out there and, one of well, the, and plus when that bell stops, <laughs> you don't know where the dog is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and that's when you really want to know where he's at because he's probably on point. Exactly. And I, yeah, you, you talk about quail hunting, Tom. One of the coolest things I've seen is the combination of a pointing dog and a flushing dog where when, when you're, you have the luxury of being able to do that and the birds hold tight, to be able to send in the flushers off of the pointer is really a sight to, to see. Well, uh, um, here's what I'm going to say to that. I mean, for people who have ever been on one of those hunts and have watched it happen, and it happens the way it should, that's that's not by mistake. That takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of training on both dogs because that pointer's got to put up with having another dog go in and flush and retrieve. Plus, you know, that retriever has got to be under control enough that um, you can, you know, walk them up, the dog's on point, you know, the, that dog is going to be 100%, not just bust in until you tell him to go in and flush. So if you ever get a chance, and I don't know where you saw it, but you probably <laughs> you probably saw it and went, oh, that was pretty cool. It takes a lot of training. I've done it, uh, but it takes a lot of training. But then it also takes a lot of maintenance, yeah. you know what I mean, to keep those dogs doing it. So if you're ever a chance to watch it, you're watching something special. A pointer being backed by another pointer and letting a flushing dog go in is <laughs> that's like a painting. So <laughs> I, I actually get a chance now to brag on on Mocha. This is obviously my little female, but this year it happened several times up in the grouse woods in Minnesota. We were hunting oh, with yeah. somebody who had a German short hair pointer. He would go on point, bring back I'd bring Mocha back to me and uh we'd go in and flush the bird and, and uh it just like Jason says, it is something spectacular to watch, and and Mocha is just that is something that um, I've watched her mature in their four years, and man, it's so cool to watch. And even if even if you miss the bird, um, it's uh, still fun to watch. Sounds like she had a good trainer. It definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> good job, my, Brian. Well, no, I think uh, <laughs> it's a combination. You know that we walked away from. You know, with after Mike turned her over to us, that it, it the work does always continue, and um, Mike set her up for for success. And I just really um, appreciative to watch dogs work like that. Yeah, I, I think the big thing there is, like you said, okay, dogs on point. Is that that you're able to have 100 percent control? Call your dog back to you under under a you know kind of a a high uh, you know high drive situation. Call them back. You settle everything down and then do it. And that it's, you know, so many of the problems that people run into out there with their dogs, no matter what breed, 99% of the time, it's just obedience related. And if you can take care of that and have good obedience in those really, you know, high stress situations. And I say high stress, meaning like excitement. I mean, that that's the majority of the problems you're going to have are, are going to be a result of of not being able to reinforce your commands. And now with the technology that's out there, it's almost it's almost something that just, you know, once you've got your dog fully trained, it's a matter of you just going, well, we're just going to stick with the program. Well, Tom, thank you so much for your time today. This uh, podcast will be live a couple days before Christmas. So we wish you and Tina and the crew at Dawkins Oak Ridge Kennel a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and thanks for your time today. Thank you, Tom. Well, Thanks so much for having me. I always enjoy the chat and I uh, hope we can do it again. There's a time and a place for every season. This is that time. And these are those special places. When preparation gives way to anticipation, rituals and traditions. Friends, family, forever. This is what you live for. It's time to celebrate the annual tradition 
like no other. It's federal season. Welcome back to It's Federal Season and the News and Notes segment. Welcome back to the final segment of It's Federal Season. It's a few days before Christmas, and if you need some last-minute gifts, check out our merchandise page at federalpremium.com for branded gear and apparel. New for customers also this year is Federal Connection. It's an all-new ammunition subscription service. You never have to worry about running out of your go-to rounds again or have to look for them on store shelves. Sign up for a one-year contract, and we'll deliver five boxes of your favorite handgun ammunition right to your door each month. Shipping is free, and orders are eligible for Federal Rewards Points. Initially, you can subscribe to some of Federal's most popular American Eagle loads, like a 115 grain 9mm, a 180 grain 40 Smith & Wesson, and a 200 grain 45 Auto. Learn more at federalpremium.com. Show season is coming up, and Federal's looking forward to seeing you in person to talk about the 2022 new product offerings from Federal. Look for us at the Dallas Safari Club show January 6th through 9th in Dallas, Texas, the Sheep Show in Reno, Nevada, January 13th through the 15th, the Western Hunting Show in Salt Lake City, Utah, February 10th through 13th, National Wild Turkey Federation in Nashville, Tennessee, February 16th to 19th, and finally, Pheasant Fest in Omaha, Nebraska, March 11th through 13th, 2022. This year, Federal will also be proud to celebrate 100 years of being a company. There'll be plenty of opportunities to celebrate this anniversary with special apparel, a commemorative book and magazine, and you can follow us on our social channels and website as Federal chronicles the history, people, and products that have led us to where we stand today and are looking forward to keeping our shooting, hunting, and conservation heritage alive for another century. Our next release of the It's Federal Season podcast will be January 18th, and our guest is Guns and Ammo contributor and LAPD officer Jeremy Stafford. He's going to be on to talk about the iconic publication Guns and Ammo, his start in the business, and his experience with the new revolutionary personal defense round that will be introduced at the SHOT Show in Las Vegas on January 18th. You don't want to miss this episode. If you like the It's Federal Season podcast, be sure to let us know by filling out a rating and review on iTunes. And remember, for us, it's always in season. It's Federal Season.